Digital image sensors normally use a bit depth of 16 bits. This means that each pixel can register 65,000 different light intensity levels. In this image, although most of the pixels have a count's value of less than 500, as we move closer to the brightest areas, the count's value gradually increases to close to 65,000. However, the human eye cannot distinguish between this many different light intensity levels. The images that you see on the screen now have a bit depth of just 8 bits. This means that there are only 256 different light levels for each primary color. How do our eyes overcome this? One defining feature of digital photography is that the image sensor has a linear response to light. This means that the light intensity and the signal recorded are directly proportional. In other words, if the light intensity doubles, so does the signal. If the light intensity is 10 times greater, the signal is 10 times greater too, and so on until the pixel becomes saturated. As the human eye cannot distinguish between that many shades of gray, what it does is delinearize the image. Initially, the signal registered increases quickly, but as the light intensity continues to increase, the increase in the signal starts to slow down. In other words, the light we detect and the signal produced in the eye are not directly proportional. Although the eye has a more limited capacity to distinguish between shades of gray, it can register very dark and very bright signals at the same time without its sensors becoming saturated. Let's look at what this means for the image itself. Here we have a photograph of M51. Because the sensor used to take this photograph has a linear response and the image is currently linear, it's not visible to the human eye because the contrast is too high. Although the count's value of the pixel in the center is 65,000, if we move the cursor just a few pixels to the side, the count's value goes down to 1,400. The human eye isn't capable of registering such an abrupt change in light intensity. In other words, the contrast in this image is too great for us to see. If we open the histogram and delinearize the image, we can gradually increase the brightness in a nonlinear way. If we continue to stretch the image more and more, we start to see the outer areas of the galaxy. Once we can see these outer areas, which are the hardest ones to register in the photograph, although we can still see the innermost, brightest areas of the galaxy, they start to lose contrast. What we're doing is shifting the image contrast to the weaker areas and losing contrast in the brightest areas. In other words, we can't have it all. We can have the linear image with a high contrast in the lightest areas, or we can increase the depth but lose the contrast in those areas. This is something that happens with practically all the sky objects that we photograph. The Orion Nebula is a classic example. Here we can see the trapezium and the nucleus of the nebula, but obviously the areas we want to see the most are the outer ones. With an unaggressive stretch, we can see the inner areas, but all the outer areas are hidden. We can gradually reveal them by stretching the image, but we lose the contrast in the inner areas. You might think that the Orion Nebula is an extreme example and this doesn't happen with many objects, but that's not the case. Here's another example. This is a planetary nebula, the Cat's Eye Nebula. In the center of the image, we have the main body of the nebula with its central star. It's a very small nebula with a lot of details inside it. But if we stretch the image, a gas halo appears. When we increase the image brightness enough to reveal this gas halo, all the details in the center of the nebula disappear. The Andromeda Galaxy is another good example. In the linear image, we can see the nucleus and the dark areas around it. But to reveal the whole spiral structure, we need to stretch the image enough to optimize the contrast in the darkest areas. But this means that we lose all the contrast in the nucleus. As you can see, we're going to encounter this problem with almost all deep sky objects. For this reason, controlling the dynamic range of a photograph is one of the most important techniques an astrophotographer can master.
In the next few videos, we're going to look at how to control the dynamic range of the objects we photograph.